Hey guys, welcome to Elevated Systems. I'm your host CJ. A couple of weeks ago, I did a video where I created a couple of new expansion cards for my framework laptop. And in the video, I asked y'all if you wanted to see a performance overview of using the framework with an external GPU. And the overwhelming response was, yes, please. So let's do this. I guess I should start by answering the first question many of you may have. The eGPU I'm using is the Razer Core X, and like all or most external GPU enclosures, it's a Thunderbolt device. And yes, the framework laptop is Thunderbolt capable. In fact, all four expansion ports are Thunderbolt 4 capable. All the Thunderbolt stuff is here from the CPU to the drivers, except for the rubber stamp from Intel. Thunderbolt is trademarked. To call a port Thunderbolt and use the little logo, the hardware needs to be certified by Intel or their third-party testing labs to ensure it meets the standards. That takes time, and from what I understand, framework is in that process. But in the meantime, it still works. I plug this Thunderbolt device into this laptop and it just detects a Thunderbolt controller and Thunderbolt protocol and works. It has no idea that Intel hasn't blessed the laptop with certification yet. It's not like some remote Thunderbolt switch is turned on once it's officially certified. Now, if Apple controlled Thunderbolt certification, I'm sure there would be like some firmware update would need to be enabled to use Thunderbolts. But anyway, I'm rambling. I did test all four ports to ensure they all perform the same, and I tested them with the USB-C expansion card and then directly plugged into the internal USB-C connector. They all perform the same, no difference. So I'm not going to get deep into the technical specs of Thunderbolt, but I will say that this is a Thunderbolt 3 device and this is a Thunderbolt 4 device but the difference isn't drastic. The important notes are the maximum bandwidth of both is 40 gigabytes per second. However, Razer says the Core X can provide up to four lanes of PCIe Gen 3 bandwidth, which would be 32 gigabytes per second because some of the bandwidth is reserved for dedicated display port bandwidth. It's further reduced by 20% for error correcting, basically for every eight bits of data, 10 bits is transmitted. Because of this, in reality, I was getting close to three PCIe lanes of bandwidth or right around 25 gigabits per second. This bandwidth restriction, as well as just having a low power four core eight thread CPU, and of course, my intended workflow guided my GPU selection. So for today's testing, I'm using a GTX 1660 and not just for testing, this is the GPU I'm using to supplement the GPU compute workload when I need it. So that's an important distinction to make. What this is, is a demonstration of a realistic and practical use of an external GPU to add graphical powers to applications that may benefit from more than what the integrated Iris Xe graphics can provide. This isn't a review of the eGPU. I'm not throwing an RTX 3090 in there to see the best possible performance of the device or how much the CPU will bottleneck performance. That's not what this is. Besides, I'm not adding a GPU that costs two or more times what the laptop does, which is just gonna be seriously nerfed by the bandwidth and CPU limitations anyway. Also, because my workflow is content creation, video editing, some 3D design work, not gaming, of course, I will be doing some gaming benchmarks. If I do an eGPU demo and don't include gaming performance, y'all will crucify me, but that's not what I'm using it for. My workload benefits from both CUDA acceleration and the Turing NVENC encoder. It's just the way the software I use was designed. But as far as what's a good range of GPUs to use with the framework, I'd say anything from an RX 580 or GTX 1060 to the RX 5700 XT or even 6600 XT or an RTX 2070 on the top end. You can go a little lower if that's what you have, but for example, even though the GTX 1050 does outperform the Iris Xe iGPU, when you factor in the Thunderbolt bandwidth limitations, the Iris Xe graphics actually start to pull ahead. And on the upper end, especially for gaming, if you add significantly more powerful graphics card, the CPU bottleneck 
will result in some pretty significant choppy gameplay. Also, current and unfortunately probably the permanent pricing of a graphics card is a consideration. All right, let's go over setup and driver installation. Then we can get into the test procedures and actual benchmark data. Setup is simple. Just install the graphics card, plug into AC power, and connect the laptop with the Thunderbolt 3 cable. Now, download the NVIDIA graphics driver. Because I'm using this as more of a professional device, I'm going with the studio drivers. However, today it doesn't matter as they're the same as the game ready drivers. For those who are not sure what the difference is between studio or game ready, Basically, game ready drivers are updated more often or sooner, ensuring compatibility or optimization with new games. That driver package is then certified to still run with no issues with various suites of professional software like the Adobe and Autodesk suites. So, if the game ready driver and studio driver are the same version number, that certification was done and they're the same drivers. Now we can install the drivers and if there aren't any problems, the system should now recognize the GPU we installed and you should see two new icons in the system tray. The first being your Nvidia settings. So let's bring those up first and there's at least one setting to change here. Under manage 3D settings, scroll down to power management mode and make sure it's selected as prefer maximum performance. This will ensure the GPU is maintained in its max power state and avoid any Thunderbolt dropouts, which will crash any applications that's using the GPU. I also typically set the default GPU from auto to the high performance NVIDIA processor. There are few exceptions where it's actually better to use the integrated graphics. We'll see that in the benchmarks in a bit, but for the most part, if you're using an external GPU, that's what you want to use. The second icon will bring up the NVIDIA GPU activity tray and show you exactly what applications are using the GPU and allow you to disconnect or reconnect the GPU. So now that it's all set up and ready to go, let's go over the test procedures. I ran a bunch of benchmarks covering productivity, professional workflows, and gaming. I ran them first just on the framework without the eGPU, so just using the Iris XE graphics. Then I ran them using the NVIDIA graphics in the eGPU on the laptop's native display. Now, because that requires the video bandwidth to run back to the laptop on the Thunderbolt cable, it does reduce performance. So the third time I ran the benchmarks on an external display connected directly to the GTX 1660 with the laptop display disabled. Now I do wanna share one discovery I made about the framework when doing this testing. To disable the screen, I just closed the laptop like I typically do when docking a laptop. But I quickly discovered this was bad because of the way the ventilation is designed. Closing the lid blocks the exhaust. This laptop draws in fresh air through the bottom and exhausts the hot air out the back behind the bezel and up through here. When you close the lid, you block those vents and there's only a tiny slit on the bottom for exhaust. So closing the lid reduces the cooling ability, which results in the CPU not being able to boost to its max boost speed of 4.6 gigahertz or for a reduced amount of time. Now, it didn't actually thermal throttle because it did maintain its 28 watt 2.8 gigahertz base frequency. However, not being able to boost as much and as often does reduce performance. So to overcome this, I just left the lid open and manually disabled the display. So let's run the numbers starting with SpecView Perf 13, which measures the system's ability to run 3D workloads from actual professional applications. For most of the tests, we see performance gains right in line with what would be expected with applications like SolidWorks, Autodesk Showcase, Maya, and Creo, giving us a large performance gains going from the integrated graphics to dedicated graphics on the native display, and again a large jump in performance when moving to an external display, while programs like Siemens NX, ImageViz 3D for medical imaging, Cadia, and 3DX Max give us moderate to significant gains using the external GPU, but relatively little to no gains on an external monitor. While the Open Detect Energy test gives us the opposite results of 
everything else. I'm not 100% sure of why the Iris XE graphics perform better here. I know the software uses ray casting algorithms and it was specifically built to run on lower end Intel based systems so a geologist can load it up on their tough book and take it out into the field but ray casting should still technically compute faster on a dedicated GPU. But if there are any OpenDetect users watching, please feel free to school me in the comments below. Moving on to something I'm very familiar with, video editing. DaVinci Resolve can make heavy use of the GPU and thanks to some more recent upgrades, so now can Premiere Pro, so the eGPU gives us some good gains. However, I can confirm this with experience, the use of an external monitor really doesn't improve performance. If we dig deeper into the results, the gains from the eGPU are pretty significant, from a 72% increase in the effects and transitions to a 169% performance boost in timeline playback. Looking at the resolve numbers, we see gains of up to 300%, and although Fusion shows an 11% gain using an external monitor, in practice, those gains are only noticeable for more complex 3D fusion scenes, not so much for simple text effects or something like delta keying. I ran the 2D and 3D mark tests in the Passmark performance test suite to demonstrate where the reduced bandwidth of using an external GPU to drive the laptop display can actually be detrimental. We can see in the overall scores in 2D graphic applications using the native display takes a 17% performance loss with the 1660 on the native display, but a 142% gain when switching to an external display. The 3D Mark gains are also significantly more substantial on the external monitor. The individual 3D scores show that the older DirectX 9 and 10 APIs do get a boost from the eGPU, but then don't really benefit too much from the extra bandwidth provided by an external display. While the newer DirectX 11 and 12 APIs are pretty much opposite, significantly hindered by the reduced Thunderbolt 3 bandwidth, but getting significantly better when the extra bandwidth is freed up. The compute numbers are slightly misleading because the compute test that this benchmark runs includes an on-screen graphical representation of the physics being computed. If the GPU was basically just crunching numbers, doing machine learning tasks, or power user spreadsheet calculations like we'll see in a couple slides from now, those 1660 native numbers would be much higher. Intel's XE graphics are very well suited for 2D graphics, so here we see that the eGPU doesn't give us significant gains in the area of direct 2D text effects and vector graphics, and all the benchmarks specifically test GPU accelerated image filters. In practice, there are only a handful of effects and filters that leverage the GPU in applications like Photoshop or GIMP, so for the most part, a dedicated GPU doesn't give us huge gains in programs like Photoshop or Illustrator. Looking at the individual test results from a PC Mark 10 Essentials benchmark, we see that an eGPU can give some uplift to common everyday computing tasks, the one exception being video conferencing, because video conferencing software is made to run on CPU-only business-type systems, so it doesn't really take advantage of the GPU video encoders. Also, the one test that skews the overall results is the spreadsheet test. The benchmark runs five different spreadsheet tests. Three are typical, commonly used types of spreadsheets like stock price tracking, which just use the CPU to calculate data. The last two tests are power user databases, which have over 200,000 rows of data. With this much data, the software can use OpenCL and leverage the GPU's parallel pipelines to calculate and sort all that data simultaneously. Most users won't see any difference doing spreadsheet work with a dedicated GPU, but power users can see a huge boost in calculation speeds. As far as 3D rendering, I skipped all the CPU-specific rendering benchmarks like Cinebench and Blender, but I did run the V-Ray GPU rendering benchmark, and as expected, there's a huge performance increase with an eGPU. Okay, now what a lot of y'all were waiting for, gaming performance, and we'll start with just a couple of synthetic benchmarks. First is Superposition, a very GPU-bound test, and as expected, 
The GTX 1660 gives us an over 300% performance boost. In Time Spy, again, we see an over 250% performance increase with the eGPU in the graphics test. And because the graphics processing was offloaded from the iGPU, the CPU was able to boost higher and longer in the CPU test, giving us a 10% gain. Okay, last chart, some actual gaming performance, and I selected just four games that each respond differently to the external GPU. First, Shadow the Tomb Raider, which is basically unplayable on the Intel graphics at 1080p high, but becomes very playable with the GTX 1660. However, because many parts of the game are very CPU bound, there are obvious CPU bottlenecking problems. GTA 5 is an example of a game that is very playable on the integrated graphics, but is improved with the external graphics, allowing you either the more frames or the ability to increase the resolution or quality settings if you want. F1 2020 is an example of a game that actually gets worse with an external GPU. Because the game is so CPU heavy, increasing the graphics power completely bottlenecks the CPU, resulting in a very choppy experience. This can be improved by increasing the resolution and quality and putting more demand on the GPU, allowing those extra microseconds for the CPU to process frames. However, there will still be significant micro stuttering issues. Finally, CSGO is a fairly CPU bound game that still gets faster and smoother on the integrated graphics as the CPU is able to boost higher and more often since the iGPU is no longer drawing power and heating up the package. All right, that was a lot of benchmarks that took a while to get through. So I think I'm just gonna let you use those benchmarks to draw your own conclusions of whether the framework laptop with or without an eGPU will meet your specific workflow requirements. As I mentioned in my review of the laptop, I got this for a highly mobile productivity system. And like the benchmark showed, there really isn't a need for an eGPU for those tasks. But it's nice to have the ability to connect my Core X and get the significant gains for video editing or 3D design if I need to. I think the biggest question people had was, does an eGPU work with the framework? And I think I very adequately answered that question. But if you have any more questions, please ask in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe when you're down there as I do have some more content planned for the framework, including more expansion card prototypes and possibly repurposing the motherboard. I also planned on doing some dedicated streaming testing with the laptop with and without the eGPU, but honestly, that can be an entire video in itself, so let me know if I should make that video. You can also check out my previous videos on the framework here, and I hope to see you in the next one. Until then, stay safe.